I didn't really hear Steve's introduction, but my name's Michael Bacina. I'm head up the blockchain group at Piper Alderman Lawyers. Um, and I'll just have a little something to share with you before we move into the panel. Um, I tried it out at NFT London, so be kind. The videos haven't hit the internet yet. But you see, there's a lot of work in taking a project from A to NFT. So here's a little rhyme to help. Some advice to you from me. Now, some projects will bootstrap and some will plan not to breach. With the lawyers and accountants too, our knowledge has a little reach. Assemble ideas from around the world and filter them for the best. It's a fierce market out there, so protect your secrets from the rest. A prophylactic NDA won't save you from every disclosure, but move in early and hit them fast. Stop them cold, you'll keep your composure. Bring along your solid team, your core founding crew. They need to tough it out and thick and thin. There's a lot you're going to do. Contractor or employee, early alignment is quite key. Restraints in team allocation, what do you pay for and what do you get for free? Whether you're a company, solo, partnership or DAO, you get advice and then press go. Those critical decisions really early on are gonna help you stall or smoothly flow. DAOs though need some legal framing, get some more stability. I'm a big fan of legal wrappers and it sure beats personal liability. If you're developing with outside help, it'll move you along real quick. You get your scope and rolls down pat, you'll be feeling great, not sick. Check that counterparty is real though, when you pay and when you don't. Indemnities and deadlines too, get results and you'll build that moat. And when you're engaging with professionals, accountants, lawyers and advisors, choose them carefully, back them on, they'll help your project soar much higher. But there's a flood of helpers coming in. Are they any good? What's the gauge? An excellent and simple test is if they're on this stage. Forming up your entity for those crucial early sales. Is it here or overseas? You want to launch it quick and chase those whales. And your pre-sale agreement is an early critical piece, covering pricing, delivery, warranties too, and just don't let those sales cease. But going the distance isn't easy, and paperwork sure ain't fun. But if you have your checklists and details right, you'll be counting ETH in the sun. You check it all off as you go, drill down on what's got stuck. Keep good records, write it down. I think we've all learned that in the last two weeks. Uh, don't leave things to luck. And hard as it is to make a talk of rhymes, couplets, a sonnet, for the letter H, well, all I had was to get a good hardware wallet. Intellectual property, it's all many lawyers can mention, and if you haven't got the basics by now, then you're not paying enough attention. Licensing is where it starts. You've got to keep those rights moving through. The brands need to be comfortable that the value will flow through to you. And jurisdictional rules for tax, they take the fun out of life, but getting your sales tax in particular sorted, it'll save you a ton of strife. Income tax too, and profit distributions, hedge those sales to stables fast. Planning right and good allowances, you build and make that runway last. Knowing your customer, it's more than just good sales. It may not be needed all the time, but when it is, don't fail. This area is always changing, but one thing is for sure. Regulators love new rules, so on-chain tracking keeps the score. Learn from what others do, but make your marketing true and fair. You don't want to end up stuck in court over a frog's derriere. And if you think lawyers are expensive now when setting up your business, if things end up caught in the courts, the costs will hurt to witness. You want some metaverse to go with that? There's quite a few these days. Build your own or jump right in. The terms of use will guide the way. You do have to read them. Do they custody anything? What's their level of compliance? If you're building and relying on their tech, you've got a real risk reliance. And that brings us to NFT launch time. I hope you've learned and made some room for the art and all the value to amount some of that law, because with your project, it'll be time to go boom. And now we reach our panel with smarter folk than me, Greg, Mike, and Hannah too, one moderator and experts three. Thank you. And so you guys have prepared your own poems too, right? Oh, of course. Like, like we discussed earlier, right? Oh, <laughs> precisely. This, this is actually a Shakespearean recitation, right? Yeah. We are at a theatre, so we should, uh, you know, I thought we should have some art. I thought maybe we could have a very quick introduction from each of you, but Steve said no more than 30 seconds, so it has to be 20 seconds, Greg. <laughs> No, just Greg Vales. Um, we've been in the space since 2016. Um, we, we do uh, 
clients around Australia and internationally. Um, we'd like to think we're we're leading in that, but there's a lot of love for everyone in the industry. So, uh, yeah. Mike Meisels, I lead the crypto native side of the business for ANZ for Chainalysis. Been in crypto since 2014, but with Chainalysis for four months, and I've learned more in four months than I have done since 2014. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Glass, a senior associate at King & Wood Mallisons, um, one of Asia Pacific's largest law firms. As I said before, I sit in the banking and finance team, but my practice is everything to do with blockchain, fintech, payments. It started out from traditional sort of payments and financial markets and has ended up in everything that we're talking about now. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, I thought we'd, we'd kick off by just getting from each of the speakers, what do you think the biggest lesson has been from the last month of the crypto world? For, for those in the NFT space, I would say. Who wants to go first? Okay, I think everyone's looking at me. Um, <laughs> I think if we're looking at it from the perspective of NFTs, there are probably a lot of lessons to be learnt from this, which is at the heart of everything that's going on, yes, there's technology, but there are also human beings. And we use the technology in a certain way. And for example, we have on-chain proof of assets, proof of reserves. But ultimately, that is what, what you actually have is only as good as the people around it. And humans are fallible. That, that's pretty clear. And I, I think that's something which we must bear in mind, regardless of what we're doing, where we are in this space, whether it's crypto, um, like sort of crypto and the financial services side, if we're on the NFT side, I think it's also relevant to remember that, as was mentioned earlier on today, NFT really is just a description of technology. And so what we've always got to focus on is what are we doing with it? What is the use? And I think that's something which is kind of being pretty clear again with all the what's been happening in the past month is people are now starting to actually focus on what are you actually doing? What did you say you were going to do and have you done that? Craig. I think for us, um, we've been advocating this for quite some time about um, getting your corporate governance in your house in order. And I think this is why it advocates that you need a lot of strong professionals around you. And, um, you know, we meet with a lot of clients quarterly and we go through systems, processes, procedures. Uh, and for the NFT industry, we've had clients that um, started from scratch and gone up to 80 million in turnover and they've gone worldwide. But all the systems, process, corporate governance are in place. Um, and whether it's GST, which is uh, they're selling to external overseas or internally, they understand all the machinations of their responsibilities within the uh, tax regulations and ASIC. And they feel very comfortable and they feel safe and it so behoves people to ensure that they have the right professionals around them because it does pay. Um, and uh, I think that's a, big, that's a massive lesson at this stage. So I'm just going to caveat what I say. So what I say is my opinion on the stage and it doesn't belong to the organisation. So sitting with lawyers and accountants, I'm going to say that straight up. So I've heard a lot of definitions, you know, all along, you know, before I started with Chain Analysis and being in this conference as well. And I think it's really, really important to define what an NFT is. And at the end of the day, NFT really just stores data on a blockchain. That's all it does. It stores information on a blockchain that associates itself with some sort of asset or some sort of ownership of what's going on. But at the end of the day, that's what an NFT is. The only difference now is that NFTs and crypto means things go faster and easier because there's no barriers in front of it. You've got more ownership about what you do yourself and how you own it. And what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is these things go super fast and get, can get super big when it comes to things like exposure, issues like fraud, money laundering, everything else, because of where we're going with technology. If you look at how things have gone from web one to web two to web three, all we've done is increase the speed at which these things can go. And so with that, you have to have a lot more protection and a lot more caution about what you're doing. Can I just say one thing? We're obviously sounding pretty pessimistic at the moment. <laughs> um, I actually think we need to remember that We've been through market cycles before and every single time 
people go back and think about what am I doing? What am I building? What's the benefit of the technology and how can I harness that? And I think that's, I'm hoping that's where we're going to get to again. Um, and, and so to bring it back to sort of what you're talking about from a corporate governance perspective, that'll help set you up for the next bull run. It'll help you set you up even forgetting about markets for success as a business. And I think the same is true when it comes to the technology um, and having sort of proof of reserves. It's also true for the legals. It's really a matter of what do you have, how are you setting yourself up and actually focusing on your core business as opposed to going, well, why would I bother building a product when I can just release a token and token go up? Yeah. I mean, I think as professionals, we want to get out of the way of the technology and the innovation. We want to encourage and foster the growth in the whole industry and people exciting. I mean, I always talk to people about the Elon Musk quote about 350 million on Twitter that are going to be doing NFTs. I mean, this is there's so much upside coming. Get ready. And uh, you know, I know some say we. I think we're still early. I think there's plenty of upside coming. Get ready. Get your stuff, house in order, and away we go. We'll get out of the way, and we want you to fly. I appreciate you bringing it back to a more upbeat point. Um, <laughs> so I was going to um, say, what's uh, ask a question about when we're getting into the scaffolding of, of um, NFT projects coming out. Do you have an example? And it could be a good or a bad one. I'll be neutral here. I'll be the neutral moderator. A, a, a good or a bad example of something you've seen in an early stage project, you don't have to dox them, but of something that the audience could draw a lesson from in do this, this is a really good thing to do, or definitely don't do what these people did. Well, I think for us, we've, we've seen um, in all aspects of all of the Web3, uh, DeFi, you name it, they've all made uh, some mistakes, some, some set up their structures before they come to us and, that, that's, and they've made some decent money and it's hard to unwind, but um, we always find a solution. So the ones, the problem is, I think, is that um, the ones, the, the best clients know what they don't know and they understand and appreciate that they need the skill set. And they're, and they're extremely intelligent in what they do. And we respect that. And when they come in and say, well, guide us, and they trust us, and they, we've proven, um, that saves them. And, uh, and, and it's so much. We can see buses coming all the time, and if they listen, you know, we can push them out of the way and guide them. So I think there, there's been a litany of that. But uh, thankfully, there's been a lot that have listened as well. So one thing I really love about my job, and I think I do have the, one of the best jobs in chain analysis, at least in this region, is that I get to work as a tech, like I'm a techie at the end of the day. I'm a techie, no matter what my role is, I'm a techie. I get to work with people who are trying to build something innovative in a new world and bring people with them. They're trying to cross the chasm into this new world, which is super exciting. Um, one of the things that we love to do at chain analysis is we love to guide people about how they can get to the point where they want to get to fast, but also protect themselves along the way. And you have to think about that. Just because we're going into this new world of Web3, you know, if you did this in Web2, you have a certain set of boundaries and you've got centralized organizations looking after you, whichever way it is. In this world where, you know, for example, if I set up a shop on the outside and I sold artwork, and you can have people coming in buying artwork and then doing things like money laundering, et cetera, et cetera. That still principle is on yourself. And the fact is that where you define what we're doing now is transferring asset value through people is that we need to be mindful of that idea that we still have ethical roles in understanding what we're trying to build for and who we're building it to and who we're engaging with, what parties are we engaging with on that side. And we only not have that in terms of ourselves as technical resources, building this new world and taking people with us on that journey. But as citizens of the country that we're in, we need to protect our security from that moment of time. And we see this with things that we're seeing in the marketplace at the moment. Web3 is borderless. Web3 has no boundaries or geolocations now. And the fact that we can build this in a world which is transparent and easy to view means that we have to think about what we're trying to do along those ways to protect ourselves. I would say the most important thing is focus on the business. Work out what you're actually doing and, work, and know that. Look at what the technology is going to be used for. So if we're taking, talking about an NFT that is in relation to art, know whether what you're giving someone is actually just something that can be displayed on their wall. 
know whether that's something that can be commercialized so you can print it out in your t-shirt know that whether or not it's actually there's some sort of royalty which then is imparted back to the original artist know whether you can actually pr sell that onto someone else under the terms of what you've given someone and then also remember that even if you have a right to say display that particular piece of artwork on your screens in your home that doesn't necessarily mean that you also have the right to broadcast that so you may not have the right to say have it behind you when you're giving a presentation um, in, out in the open in public. All of these things should be worked out at the time when you're creating your project. And it's not about the NFT because the tech is going to be very similar, if not the same. The legals around that are what is going to be different. But it doesn't, it's not a matter of coming to, say, one of us and saying, I want to do an NFT for art. Or I want to do an NFT which relates to IP for art. It's actually about thinking, what do you want to do? Who are you providing it to? To piggyback off your point, who are your customers? How, what, what is the idea that you're working with? And also recognizing that, okay, fine, if it's an NFT for art, then we're looking at IP. But if it's an NFT in relation to tickets, it's a completely different realm. And again, what you're looking at is nothing to do with IP rights and licensing you're actually supposed to be focusing on contractual provisions, rights to enter into a venue. Um, you're looking at whether or not you can actually transfer that to someone else, whether there are any restrictions on transference, whether, for example, it's an over-18s event, or you simply can't transfer it because that's against the terms and conditions. And what you actually have is something that you can then keep as memento as your ticket, um, and maybe you get some other sort of little little POAP, um, which can be used for something else in the future. But all of these things go back to what are you building? Who are you building it for? And working that out up front and not just going, I've created an NFT. Because really, you've just created, that's just a piece of tech. If I can add into that, if you think about what's going on at the moment in Qatar, you've got the World Cup, which is probably the most watched sport on the planet. And however many billion people are going to watch the final. Imagine that an NFT could be the interchange between a ticket that has some sort of merchandise to say that you were at the World Cup and it's your entrance. If you think about how you buy that NFT is through an anonymous wallet, who can resell that to you? Can you be a ticket tout selling those NFTs to someone else? And what happens to the royalties of those things? If you think this is just data that gives you ownership of something, what is the principles or the guide works or the framework behind those NFTs, which is what Hannah was touching on? And all of that needs to be built from a technological perspective, but also from a legal perspective. And you've got to have those two working together. We, we talk about this concept of a tech architecture marrying up with a legal architecture. And unless the two actually work and you know where the inflection point is, so for example, if you can't on sell um, tickets to a ticket scout, but you could transfer it to your friend. How do you build that into the tech? Or do you just say, it's too difficult to build into the technology, we're going to build it into the legal terms, and then find another way of enforcing it through humans? Just the, um, listening to the legal eagles, it's uh, the bean counters also just uh, <laughs> chime in and we wanted to say something about the, uh, the you know, the volumes of transactions we found uh, you know, can be quite daunting, and that's um, the minting process, the secondary market, the staking, um, all these things can be planned, and putting all these down and mind mapping every part of it, it helps in the de-risking of your whole project, and trust me, that's what, you know, Hannah and Michael talk, talking about, is the early recognition of what's got to get done, it de-risks everything um, from, from all aspects. You know, we may get people to come in and look at um, a, a tokenomics or the white paper or whatever in from a DeFi. All of the aspects are done so we can de-risk at a very early stage. And, and how, Greg, just jumping off from that, how would you say the tax tools are around early stage? We can't get away from legals without tax coming into it somewhere. Um, you and I have seen some you know, early stage projects that charge ahead with not much regard for tax and have had to do some things to fix it up later, but how do you find the tools are now, if it's dealt with early enough, do you think it's making it easier or is it irrelevant? Yeah, to I, I think if, um, if any of you here are worrying about your compliance and your tax, that's an issue, right? And you need the right people around you where you don't even, that's not even a, a, a concern because everything else has been put in place. Uh, with 
ITI with ASIC, none of the regulatory authority should be an issue for you because you've got all that corporate governance right um, and we've seen that where people have not understood the nuances of the NFT uh, within each of the frameworks of building uh, the GST. Oh, by the way, I saw in your little poetic justice, I didn't have the heart to tear, there's no more sales tax, by the way, but I didn't want to upset your rhyme. Well, but, um, it's global. <laughs> it's <represented> global. global. <laughs> it's been uh, re GST repealed. Uh, it's but, very hard to rhyme with but, that, Greg. But, <laughs> but basically, um, um, we... we we think you can placate all of that. Look, the ATO is still, um, it's doing its best. It's trying to understand the technology is moving such a, at a quick rate. But you can get reasonably argued positions. You can safe pull uh, a number of things with great tax lawyers and, and, and governance lawyers to make sure that you're safe and, and you're flying through. And just quick observation from things that have happened that have really affected our industry. That could have easily been done uh, if we had put a lot of controls and uh, for, for people's behaviour, not the technology. And that can, that's still a great learning lesson. But at the end of the day, as we know, the greater majority of people in the Web3 industry are fantastic people and do, do the right thing. Um, and that's what we've got to be keep marching on. I might add to one little point on tax. It's, and it feels weird because people are always thinking of, you know, the law or there's a bright line somewhere or sometimes it's grey. But when it comes to particularly tax compliance, when you have a regulator who doesn't um, necessarily have the educative skills, if they feel like a project is trying to do the right thing mm -hmm. in the face of uncertainty and problems, it's very important that that narrative is set early. Yeah. Because if it looks like someone's trying to be cheeky, the people they're dealing with, to Hannah's points, we're all people. The regulators are also people who work there as well. And if they see something that they feel like it's uh, really going up to the line issue, then you may have a very different response to someone who says, oh, they've tried to do the right thing, they've flagged the issues that are problematic, and that's where we're stuck. Okay, fine, there's a slightly different potential resolution there. Because ultimately, mm. if there is a problem with a regulator, it's a person, it's not a faceless regulator yeah. you're dealing with. It's a person interpreting the faceless regulations that sit behind it all. Yeah, and, and we just follow the basic principles. You can't KYC them, or we don't know where the money is, we don't touch it. Uh, we know what the ATO, eventually ATO is going to have unbelievable diagnostic tools and they will catch up. So we just make sure that everything How will is... They use, where will they get that from, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be telling No. Oh. Yeah. There's Mike. And can, Mike, can I ask, um, who, who came up with the prison orange colour for the shirts? <laughs> <laughs> is, orange is the new black. <laughs> <laughs> be careful about what you do because you could be wearing orange the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> You guys got to do a great yeah, did you see of, that little a, clothing, a clothing division in, <laughs> inside the, the uh, business. <laughs> the interesting thing about the tax and the ATO is, you know, it's something I never thought about before coming into this side of the world and, you know, speaking to these smart people on the stage with me is that, you know, if you think about the NFT industry, $44 billion went into this world last year in 2021. And if you think about it, how, and it's probably an open question to these guys, is how do you regulate that from a tax point of view? So who's paying tax where? Capital gains? You know, I'm just thinking things from my point of view, let alone from a people that know what they're talking about point of view, is if you've got these things that are backing assets of some sort and they're increasing in value, how do you say to the ATO, you know, we've just generated X amount of wealth or we've you know, we want to pay GST on our sales, but you've got this borderless world about, you know, it's just a wallet address. You know, it's a wallet address that interacts on this chain and we don't know who we're talking to. We don't know if they're in Australia, Iran, US, Canada, UK, etc. You know, so we talk about security, but we also talk about tax and, you know, at the end of the day, these guys are going to want their share of the money from it. I think the greatest... Um number of questions I think Ronnie and I get in our office is that um, people say, look, um, I want to set up around the world somewhere, but um, where are you going to stay? Oh, we're going to stay here. And I said, well, good luck with that, um, because control and central management is what they look at, domiciled, where it's all being done. So there's a number of nuances there. So you want to be very careful about doing that. On the other hand, I think Mike and I were in... Um, we're lucky enough to be guests at the Consulate General's in New York 
um, and Nick Griner was there, and was, I think there's only about 10 of us. Steve got us into that room. Um, and the first th the thing he asked me, or the first thing I volunteered to him was the greatest risk that we've got in Australia is that people will leave. And I've had a client that's up and left uh, Australia and relocated, and we still do their CFO role. But we need the regulators to get to get going and understanding the nuances of the NFT, the DeFi, and the competitive spirit that's happening around the world. And and that is a real big issue at the moment. Some people won't leave because their families here domiciled. The ones that are, have no connections are wanting. And I've had clients now asking uh, at a very high level um, how they can relocate overseas. So that is a big risk at the moment. Mike, have you seen that as well? Oh, yes, I think I know who you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> but that's, a, that's an early scaffolding question. So if you've got a project, and people historically will bootstrap in, in the tech world, but if there's a bunch of profits that have been made or, or value created and then someone wishes to relocate, and we've had people come in saying, I've, I've made X big amount of money and I'd like to go, and then we have to explain to them, well, when you leave Australia, you have to pay CGT on all of your assets, which, of course, they don't like. But um, planning things early is, is really the only way around that. Uh, to Hannah's point, it's about figuring things out and, and getting it down in detail early and putting the time into it. When, of course, it's a horrible tension, the very pressure is the time to build the thing and ship the thing and worry about the details later. Um, and it's a, it's a rare company that can be an Uber and come along later with a money hose to, to um, wash away their problems. Uh, it's much, much harder to do it up front. But I've seen people who've stuck into it and got it done and been very successful as well. And that ensures the value they're creating is protected going forward. So that gives them pun intended, a good scaffolding and foundation to build on. But I'd actually almost say that that's a strategy in and of itself. So you've got to work out again, what's the strategy up front? There's another nuance which is more so on other aspects and one of the really difficult things I think people realise is there are different jurisdictional tests for different parts of our laws. So tax is different to AML, is different to financial services, is different to general carrying on a business and consumer law. And they're all similar, but different. And then that does mean that you might be outside for one, but inside for another. And I think, again, that's a certain nuance that needs to be considered. Again, it's a, it's a business thing. It's not a tech question. Um, and so there are projects which are completely offshore, um, which may be caught by our consumer laws, for example. And we've seen this in technology much more broadly when services are provided by the internet. So we're not talking... Web 3 here, we're talking Web 2, have already experienced this. So Web 3 will as well. Excellent. Now, I believe we have almost run out of time, so on just a rapid-fire last one, I would like to know of an NFT project that you admire. It doesn't have to be your favourite. won't make you pick a favourite child. Tell me an NFT project you admire, and then we are going to have to wrap up. Mike, you go first. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go old school. Crypto Kitties. Nice. Because nice. they actually created where we are now. That was the first project to actually go out there and to gain traction. Greg? Um, well, Lazy Lions, I don't know if Ash is here. He's, he's, uh, Shout he's, out to them. He's, they've killed it. Um, very smart cookies. Um, and there's the plethora of ones that are going around at the moment. Um, I'm going to take it back to some of my childhood. It's definitely some of these games, the online games. So the online games that you can swap and sell and buy things to make things better. I think that's you know, a fantastic utility for these types of tokens, you know, outside of kitties, cats, dogs, you know, all of these different things. So you're still waiting for Monopoly NFT to be released. Yeah. Pretty much. Excellent. And I, and or I Street wait, Fighter. <laughs> Excellent. And I love the AO app ball. There'll be cool stuff coming out for that. Always good to come out for tennis. If you'd all join me in thanking our experts, we appreciate it very much.